Welcome to the Brute Strength Podcast, bringing you worldwide experts from all areas of health and fitness. We cover training, nutrition, coaching, and mindset. Welcome your host, strength and conditioning coach, 2012 and 2013 CrossFit Games champ, Michael Cashew. Mind, body, brute. Hey, and welcome back. My name is Mike Cashew, and you're listening to the Brute Strength Podcast. This week, I've got Trevor Moad on the show. Trevor is one of the top sports psychologists on the planet. And this is a really special episode for me because the way that I first learned about Trevor was my dad sent me an article that he was featured in um, from some Alabama newspaper talking about the, the brain trainer of the Alabama football team. And if you follow college sports or really sports in general, you'll know that the current Alabama team and coach Nick Saban are one of the biggest football dynasties of all time. And so when he sent me that, I knew that this guy must be special. And so I researched him, I followed him for years. And then finally, uh, I found a connection through a mutual friend of ours and got the opportunity to do an interview with him. So <clears throat> Trevor has coached at the IMG Academy, which prepares people for the, or athletes for the NFL combine, as well as a number of other professional sports. He's worked with coach Saban at both Miami and Alabama. He currently coaches at the university of Georgia and works with a number of the best professional athletes in the world, such as Russell Wilson. We start the show off talking about a life changing event that he had in college that set the course for the rest of his career. We talk about things that he learned from world champion sprinter Michael Johnson, such as how to be successful and stay there. And then we spend the majority of the show talking about the most important thing that he teaches all of his athletes, which is how to think neutral. He talks about why this whole concept of uh, positive thinking is not only overrated, but is sometimes flat out bad advice. Uh, we talk about also how to eliminate negativity. This guy is at the absolute top of his field, and what I really love about Trevor is the simplicity that he brings to an otherwise just really complex topic. There are so many gems in here, and I know you're going to get a ton out of it. Enjoy the show. Trevor, thank you so much for making some time for me today, man. Michael, it's a, it's a pleasure. I, I know we've been kind of trying to connect for a while, so I'm glad that we uh, finally get the opportunity to First of all, you and I spend time together, but also with uh, the incredible population uh, that you're connected to, who, uh, who, who in one way or another, um, we're all sort of striving to uh, to increase performance. Hell yeah, man. So I haven't told you this yet, but the, the way that I originally heard about you, my dad, it was probably four or five years ago, my dad sends me an article. I think I was training for the CrossFit games at the time. He sends me an article about the, the Alabama brain guy or wh whatever, whatever they called you at the time. Yeah. And I remember reading this article and in the article, Nick Saban is, is saying that you're the guy that has completely changed their, like the entire culture, the environment, and you were largely responsible for the su success that they had at Alabama. And this was right around the time when I was starting to book starting my obsession with uh, sports psychology in general. So to have you here on the show is such a, a pleasure for me. And I'm really appreciative of your time. Well, you know, I don't know who wrote that article. I would always say that in my nine years uh, at, at Alabama and a uh, year with coach in Miami, it, you know, coach is 100 percent the reason for the program's success. Uh, but I do believe that uh, um, for myself and the other psychological experts that had the opportunity uh, to embed with uh, Scott Cochran and, and the strength conditioning staff and the, the whole group, I do think that uh, one of the unique uh, competitive environments, I think, in the athletic world that has created an architecture which sort of really factors in the the overall uh, mental uh, conditioning, sports psychology, peak performance, clinical mental health counseling. I mean, really, all of those elements is uh, is Coach Saban's. You know, I, I was at an NBA event last night and I was sort of hosting this panel on. Uh, 
uh, you know, broadly speaking, mental health, but but uh, across multiple disciplines. And, you know, I, I told this audience of three to four hundred coaches and influencers, you know, within the uh, AAU and, and sort of uh, basketball community that if you look at this area, uh, like this is the right thing to do and we should do this to help kids and athletes and people. So we have conversations that are, you know, therapeutic, I, then you're never going to do it. Like what I what I vividly remember in 2007, 2008 and 2009, sort of those early origins in Alabama was Coach Saban didn't do it for those reasons. Uh, he did it to win. Mm -hmm. And w when you factor in the the overall m mindset of your individuals and your coaches and your organization, um, uh, you know, simply uh, as as an important element of your overall organization that if we have A, B, C, D, and E, we can win, then you're going to take care of those things. If you look at it philanthropically, like, you know, I should address this area just because it's the right thing to do. Right. You're never going to do it. And that's why uh, in college football, the sports psychology piece has never grown. Uh, it hasn't grown anywhere in sports, really. Um and probably the the place that it lives most, you know, I would I would say significantly is in the business world, mm -hmm. um, and that's probably uh, you know uh, Michael because it's a tax write off and you have to do something <laughs> anyways yeah. from a human resources perspective for your employees. So um, I, I guess the. I'm fired up that you read that, and there always are some unique articles, but 17 years ago when I started at, at IMG Academies at, at 26 years old, uh, mental conditioning and sports psychology were the future of sports, and uh, sort of unfortunately, 17 years later, they're, they're still the future of sports, and outside of a few programs, they've, they've yet to have a present. That's such an interesting perspective about the the philanthropic versus uh, like gaining an edge kind of thing. It, it reminds me of just trying to make a difference in the world. I don't like if you if you want to end hunger, I don't think it'll ever end just because it's the right thing to do, but it'll end because someone will be able to make money off of it. Correct. You know what I mean? And, 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 and that would be okay because exactly. You know, fundamentally, we're motivated in three ways. We're motivated through through fear, which as much as we can say that's not the right way to be motivated because it's it's an external motivator, it still works, uh, but it's always temporary and it's coming from the outside. We're motivated through incentive, which is if I do A, then I'm going to get B. And then the last leg, you know, we're motivated because of this desire to make a difference or this desire to be great. And I think fundamentally, if you're if you're if you're influencing yourself or if you're influencing other people, you recognize in truth that you're going to need to use all three of those to motivate yourself or others or your business or this country at different times. You know, at times you need to be motivated by fear because you're having a health challenge or you need to be motivated by incentive because you want uh, money. And then other times you're motivated to be great because when you step up in those CrossFit games, you, you want to beat people's ass. Right. And, and so like it, so we're, we're kind of motivated across all those things. And I don't think you should judge them one way or the other, as long as the outcome ends up being what you want. Why do you think you guys were able to at Alabama? How were you able to create a culture that a and maybe maybe I'm off with this, but certainly from my perspective, it seems this way. I grew up a huge LSU fan, so I've always been pretty plugged into the SEC community. It seems like Alabama, since Saban began there and during your time, the players have gotten in significantly less trouble and they are significantly more poised in the game. How do you get, and, and it's, you know, Alabama is pulling from the same recruiting field as all of the other SEC teams, right? How are you guys able to incentivize and get that buy-in uh, for that to happen? Well, uh, I think so. You know, I first started with with Coach Saban in 2006 with the Dolphins, um, and uh, you know that in itself was a unique experience. I, I had spent five years already in the NFL working for the Jacksonville Jaguars on a, on a consulting side. Uh, but really, my first experience in college football was was 2007, 
And uh, I, I think people forget that that first year uh, we were six and six, um, including you know a, a really tough home loss uh, to Louisiana Monroe, and, and and just you know barely beating Houston, um, and and so it, it wasn't like the formula was always mature. I, I think where Coach Saban. And the coaches that that work for him and and are able to succeed within his environment, you know, Ray Kroc, the founder of McDonald's, uh, said, "If you're green, you grow, and if you're ripe, you rot." And you can be green and growing at 68, and and ripe and rotting at 24. Mm-hmm. And 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 fundamentally, what that means is that you, you're open to to seeing a better way to get something done. And I, I just don't think people have any uh, awareness or understanding of how open Coach Saban is uh, to to growing and, and improving and getting better in any area that can help you compete. So I, I think, you know, when you come into an environment, the culture was what it was. Mike Shula was a good football coach. He he obviously comes from football royalty and in terms of being Don Shula's son, and he was a great quarterback. Um but w- what I would largely guess about him, not knowing him uh, well, is, is he probably looked at football, you know, only through football. And I think Coach Saban s- saw every element of running a program, from fundraising mm-hmm. uh, to the performance side. I think I think hiring Scott Cochran, um, who was at that point a strength coach uh, with the New Orleans Hornets. Um, and, and I think it, who had been with them at LSU, who'd seen the platform, who'd seen the formula. Um, but I, the traditional strength coach back then was more of, all right, I'm going to warm warm up the guys and I'm going to put them through the lifting and then I'll probably manage the scouts. Mm-hmm. Uh, Scott was an incredible relationship person. He was a problem solver, uh, not just was, but is. Um, and he is a really big picture thinker. Um, and I think a lot of strength and conditioning coaches were allowed to be myopic. And uh, I mean, even in all my years in Bradenton, which I ultimately became the director of performance, so I oversaw a number of strength coaches. Like we would bring Michael Johnson in. Uh, you know, IMG would, you know, obviously Michael from 1990 to 2001 was the fastest man in the world. Mm-hmm. And I would listen to all our strength coaches. Michael would come in and he would work with the, the guys getting ready for the NFL combine. And all these guys would say like they they would they would just be sideways listening to Michael talk about his starts and his speeds. And like and, and, they, and I would hear them say, like, what what does this guy know about speed? And then I would be thinking like, well, I mean, he, he you know, he is the fastest man in the world. Like there must be something he knows about it, and 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 I and I learned early on that the strength and conditioning environment, uh, just maybe through the competitive nature of it, uh, was was incredibly, um, you, you know, uh, competitive and 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 maybe uh, not broad enough in its thinking. Right. Um, that that uh, I have the best formula for uh, uh, you know increasing. Uh, you know, speed, strength, power, bigger, faster, stronger, what are all, all these elements? And ultimately, um, the fact of the matter is uh, there's 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 a lot of different ways to do a lot of different things. There's really no one right way or wrong way. Uh, it, you have to find the architecture that's going to work best relative to your needs. And that's where I think Coach Saban uh, was just such a big picture thinker and was able to delegate. And if you're going to work for him, you have to be very good at what you do, but he's going to give you an opportunity to own that. So the mindset piece in which as it developed, I was ultimately just one of six people um, in the area that I lived in, which was probably two to three percent of the overall hundred percent, I was responsible for that. And when it was my turn to to do what I was supposed to do, I better be able to perform, mm-hmm. or I wasn't going to last. And uh, if if you are weak, you will never survive in the Alabama architecture. If you're a, a mental conditioning coach, you have to be at the absolute top of your field, or you will get smoked out. And if you're a competitor like I am. Uh, I love that. So uh, I I would say to go back to your original question, the difference between LSU and some of these other places is, A, you're factoring in every element that makes an athlete great. 
um, and you're assigning experts to those people, Mm -hmm. you're allowing them to own it, and then you're coming at winning with a a wide net, which gives you a better chance to influence more people. Ah, I love it, man. So you grew up, your dad, Bob Moad was one of the pioneers of sports psychology. And so you grew up w- watching him work with some of the biggest companies in the world, like NASA, Starbucks, and at and I'm curious what it was like to grow up with a dad like that. Can you, can you maybe remember a time where you made a mistake or had something that you considered a failure at the time and maybe what he said to you, like how he helped you overcome that? Yeah, I'm. I'm. It, it's in, sort of unique. Like, I'm. I'm very grateful for the way I grew up, but it also really informed me. I think. I think what's allowed me to sort of uh, develop within this this field has been uh, an understanding, uh, authentically and organically, and a real belief in in what you teach. I mean, I, I can hear in your voice that what allows you to succeed is, is this belief that fundamentally, um, we can get better, we can get stronger, we can, we can get, we can be more competitive. We can take a step forward from wherever we're at. Um, one of the things, Michael, that I think has really hurt the, the field of, uh, mental conditioning. When, when my dad was coming out, it was peak performance education positive psychology Mm -hmm. uh the 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 experts in the early 70s were on the on the christian side dr norman vincent peel who had wrote sort of this uh really uh fundamental uh book in the 50s and 60s called you can if you think you can and then there was uh maxwell maltz who had developed the concept of cybernetics um, and I actually think most of the best books were written in the fifties and sixties. I don't think that they've evolved or there. I mean, there's some great books by Adam Grant and, and a lot of other people, uh, now that are really good, but, um, I was never raised, uh, with any emphasis or, or being told to be positive. And I think what's really hurt the industry that I work in now is the emphasis on positive thinking. I, I think positive thinking has its strengths, uh, and and it, but it 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 puts a lot of uh, unnecessary anxiety on people when they're told uh, over and over again, "You need to be more positive. You mm-hmm. need to be more positive." And what I was really raised in, and where I'm probably most grateful for, is a unique absence of negativity. Um, we weren't uh, allowed to say the word "can't." Can't was the worst four letter word in our home. Um, so it was from five, six, seven years old. I was taught that uh, it was called stinking thinking. And my dad uh, would, would play on this piano at this young age or play on a ukulele. This, you know, we don't allow no stinking thinking around here. And he would, <laughs> and, and, nice. and so I knew this song. Um, from a young age, and he had these this book series called Your, Your Nature's Greatest Miracles that was designed for like four to eight-year-olds. So every night I went to bed uh, when my dad was traveling, my mom would play these uh, audio tapes, not just from my dad, but from Earl Nightingale and, and uh, Norman Vincent Peale. And they also played cybernetic waves that were, you know, you positive thinking and whatnot. Mm-hmm. Um, and then every night I'd go to bed, Michael, I, I would say a series of what my dad called uh, neutral statements, uh, which were uh, process-based behaviors that, that weren't driven by an outcome. So I would say I, I take setbacks as temporary and I bounce back quickly, uh, regardless of what's going on in my life, I love myself unconditionally. Uh, uh, there's nothing I can't do if I'm willing to put the effort into it. Um, and I would say a series of six to seven statements, five different times out loud with my mom starting at the age of four, uh, every night. And, um, so we weren't allowed to watch the nightly news. We couldn't listen to country music. We didn't listen to rhythm and blues. Um, and my dad believed that the real strength of allowing yourself to succeed was, was eliminating negativity, um, and not trying to pressure yourself to be more positive. Um, and if you look at Harvard's recent studies that if, uh, uh, negativity as it's received in our life, we receive at a four to seven times higher rate than it's equal opposite positivity. So if we can learn how to be less negative, uh, we, we take a lot of pressure off ourselves trying to be more positive and they're fundamentally 
two different things. And, and we can talk more about that. But um, I think there are environments where you can you can be positive. And, and I do think that I'm somebody that's learned how to do that. But if you were to say, Trevor, you've worked with Russell Wilson for six years. He's 5'10". He's overcome every obstacle. Is it because he's got an incredible you know, incredibly positive attitude. I'd say he has the ability to be that way, but where his strength is, is he's never negative, particularly in his articulation of it, the verbalization of it. And then he's a great neutral thinker. And a neutral thinker is, uh, I am going to not pretend that something bad didn't happen, but I'm also not going to give it power over what happens next. And that's what it means to to, to be neutral. And I think as a competitor, as an athlete, you can't lie to yourself. Um, if you're like, think about cancer, you, you know, you're no sicker the day after diagnosis than you are the day before yep. truthfully. But for many people, that label is the beginning of the end. Mm-hmm. And, and so how do you process it and acknowledge it and feel that emotion, but then also recognizing that that there is a better way forward that I can navigate uh, and I don't have to live in that pain. And uh, that doesn't mean I'm going to, I'm going to make it. And this is, this is, I think uh, the real problem is while we can say that that positive thinking doesn't work all the time. um, You know, if you check any Mayo clinic uh, or web MD study, you will find that negative thinking will operate almost at an 83% efficiency rate. So if I'm negative, uh, almost eight out of 10 times, I will achieve a negative outcome in my own life. So why would I gamble and go that way? Right. That is so powerful. And what, yeah, one of the most impactful things that I've heard you say is uh, a story. You told a story about um, the Seahawks being down 16, 16 to zero. And Russell Wilson said to the team something, something to the effect, we're only down 16 to zero. I don't know what you're going to do, but I'm going to fight. And I mean, it, no matter what your discipline is, no matter what sport you play, setbacks, adversity is always going to be a huge factor and how you deal with that, like that's the difference between good and great. And so I've never heard, I've never heard the, the, perspective that you're giving, right? It's not, let's overcome it with positivity. Let's overcome it with acceptance and focusing on what action we can take. Am I, am I on the right path? Yeah. You you know, and I think a couple of years ago, I got a call sort of out of the blue uh, and I'm and I'm sort of apolitical or politically agnostic. But I but I got a call from Maria Shriver, um, who obviously is, uh, you know, John F. Kennedy's niece and, and formerly married to uh, to someone your community would know fairly well, uh, Arnold uh, yep. Schwarzenegger. And um, and so I went out and, and 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 she was sort of fascinated in this sort of mental conditioning and sports psychology area. And she she has a unique thing that I think your your audience would be interested in called architects of change. Just people who are in their own way influencing uh, change in the world, whether it's in athletes, whether it's in women's, uh, whether it's in domestic violence or or human performance or, or whatever. So I went and I met for with her for three or four hours and she was probably outside of nick saban who when you meet nick he's an intimidating guy um she was probably uh as intimidating um to meet in person but she was super cool uh, as we got uh, as we got going but she had challenged me she said you know you've got a message that nobody ever hears and it's only being heard by 50 or 500 athletes in this really small high 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 level you've got to take your message to 50 million people and um, you know, and you, and you could really help in, in our women's movement with the 50 million women. And I was like, man, I'm struggling enough in my own house to, to, to <laughs> yeah. you know, let alone 50 million women. But, uh, but it was a, it was a call to arms where it really challenged me and made me think about that. And um, uh, y- you know, if you're sort of embedded deep into sports at Alabama or Florida State or Georgia or, you know, you're working at Fort Bragg or you're in these things, you either feel like uh, you don't have the time to write books or sometimes you're like, well, everything's been written or 
or you're just kind of going, you know, I'm on a plane 250 days a year, which I'm currently in the process of, of trying to adjust and scale and, mm-hmm. and, and, and help my own life be better. But I think one of the things Russell and I have talked about, and then I talked a lot with Maria about was we don't hear anything about neutral thinking. And, uh, I, you know, I watched Tony Robbins and, and I would suggest people see it, but he, there's a Netflix film called I Am Not Your Guru. Love it. And it was super cool. And, and, and y- you know, I'm always asked, well, what's the difference between you and him, you know, outside of obviously a significantly different wallet. Uh, <laughs> but but Tony's audience is actively looking for his help. Um, I'm embedded into the deep sports world and nobody wants my help. So I have to go in with the best athletes in the world and establish my relevance and become a factor in their life. And that's for 17 years has been my population. How do I go into a place like Alabama where you already have many of the best athletes in the world and, and, or Jacksonville or the Miami Dolphins or uh, Jadavian Clowney or Sam Darnold and Baker Mayfield and all these different guys. These are some of the best football players on the planet, guys. The best football players on the uh, on the planet um, or Michael Johnson or Justin Gatlin. I mean, you, you know, truthfully, I'm, I, it's just – if you're going to make a phone call to somebody in this industry, there's only a small population of us that have had that experience, whether we're, I would tell you fundamentally, I probably have a 25 IQ, but I do have, (laughs) I do have experience in this area. Right. Um, but most of my population, I'm always starting over. I, I, I have to convince them of the relevance of this information. Mm -hmm. And then I have to help them understand that, whether they believe in these things or not, and just because they can't see them, they're no different than gravity. You know, I, I studied gravity in 10th grade, but gravity started affecting me right when I was born because it's a universal reality whether I acknowledge it or not. And that's our, our mentality, our mindset, the way we talk, the way we verbalize, negativity, neutrality, positive thinking. All of these things uh, are affecting us. So when... When uh, when Kirby Smart hires you and you go to the University of Georgia and you get 85 scholarship guys, 120 players, and you start with these, uh, you hit the summer and you've got four groups of 35 guys, you, you, they've never heard of you. They've never been exposed to you, and, and you're coming in with – all their preconceived notions, which could be like Mac Foley down from the river and Saturday night live. And so that's how I'm always starting. Whereas Tony Robbins has these people like you, Michael, Mm -hmm. that are, that have been studying it, that have been researching it, that are coming to him and saying, make me better. And so what I realized uh, over the years, particularly once I hit 40 was I need to move to that population because I think I have a message that's even easier than what they're seeing right now in the books. I, you're not going to hear me talk about mindfulness or meditation. or And it's not that those aren't important because they are. But to me, those are an advanced placement U.S. history course when people just need to learn the 50 presidents. Right. Right. And that's <laughs> that's the one thing that, you know, if you are embedded deep into sports, and, and you look at, well, what what is Alabama doing or Georgia doing or Florida State doing? You know, they are eliminating negativity. They're not talking about the heat. They're not complaining the cultures because I cannot complain. I can shut my mouth and that takes no effort. But to try to force myself to be positive does take effort. But the real strength is just not being negative. So just shut up. And and anybody can do that. And anybody can just, you know what, I'm not going to watch CNN or Fox News or MSNBC for six hours. I'm just not going to watch it. And it, until I can learn how to watch it responsibly in the same way I would watch House of Cards on Netflix. Mm-hmm. And, and, and so, um, you know, you can probably hear I'm passionate about it because one of the things Russell and I have been doing, uh, we did it with our ESPN show, Quarterback to Quarterback this year, uh, stepping in for John Gruden, was – we want people to understand the simple part of the the mental piece um, before. And that doesn't mean that these great messages that uh, Michael Gervais and Tony Robbins and Ryan Holiday and all these different things, these guys are incredibly message, incredible messages. They're, I can promise you, way more uh, 
uh, intellectually capable than myself. Uh, but there, there are messages that are even easier uh, that I think people uh, would accept more readily because they're a little bit more obvious. Man, that's that's so powerful. Um, I'm sure you've heard the shit. You might have even taught it to him. I, I heard. I, I learned this concept from some Navy SEALs: suffer in silence, because the you know when when you're in a team environment or in a community, just hearing someone else complaining can immediately put you in a in a negative mood, right? And so by suffering in silence, by not being negative we keep the environment more neutral, as you're saying. Well, this is, yes, I agree. Uh, but fundamentally, th this is how I would look at that. I, I would say, um, think about, so let me ask you this. Uh, you have a beautiful significant other, that's correct? Correct. And if you two were to watch a, a, a television show on TV, um, like what would, in the last five years, what's been your favorite show? Game of Thrones. Okay, so Game of Thrones. Um, what has been your uh, favorite um, non-cable um, show, uh, like uh, 24 from like Jack Bauer, or, or is there any show that you would watch on NBC or any no, of those? I haven't, I haven't watched those in probably 10 years. Okay, so 10 years ago, um, 10 years ago, what's a show that you remember? Oh, shit, man. I'm challenging you. As Let's a, as go. As a kid. As a kid. E even Stevens. Okay. So was that a 30-minute show or a 60-minute show? I'm going to say 30 minutes, but I really don't remember. Okay. So if it was a 30-minute show and it, it aired on television, it would be 21, uh, 21 minutes and 30 seconds. Right. And the other eight and a half minutes would be what? Commercials. Advertisements. Okay. Advertisements. And, and, and why do you think Michael Companies... Um, I mean, think about the NFL. It's almost nine billion dollars in advertising revenue. Mm -hmm. But why? Why do you know? And even Stevens, why would uh, companies invest, uh, you know, in advertising to you as a seventeen-year-old consumer? Why? Uh, why would to, they spend to prepare me to either well to either get my parents to buy something or to prepare me to buy something later? Okay, so so either to influence your parents to mm -hmm. buy you something or to affect you to influence your parents to buy something or to prepare you down the road to buy something. But right. companies spend millions of dollars on advertising, uh, you know, ultimately uh, because it works. Would you agree? Absolutely. So there's no doubt that that advertising works. We watch a commercial. We hear a song. Um, you know, for me in my early 40s, I can say – Two all beef patty, special sauce, lettuce, cheese, pickles, onions on a sesame seed bun. Yep. That I deserve a break today because it's Mac tonight, and I, I mean I will literally be driving down the road sometimes. Now, now your community may be uh, more disciplined than than I can be at sometimes, but uh, the the golden arches feel like the Death Star and a uh, tractor beam. Yeah. Um, and it's not because the food is so good, but it's because of the advertising of McDonald's. And there's a reason that there's 18 billion people served and, and that in my early years, I had been, you know, part of that 18 billion. Yep. yep. Um, cause it works. So to, to go back to your original question that, that you heard from the, the SEAL community outside advertising has an impact on us. So when people complain, or when people tell us to do something, or people say, Michael, I believe in you, or, or for the, the people listening to this right now who are surrounded by incredibly uplifting people who have encouraged them to be better, or had they been surrounded by incredibly negative people that have affected them you know, from a negative perspective, um, I, I think one of the unique challenges is that, that that influence, it does work and it affects us. But what we've learned is that the outside influence on us is one tenth as powerful as our inside ad campaign. Mm -hmm. So if if Nike in '87 was 990 million dollar company, and two years later it was a nine billion dollar company, and in the middle of that was a slogan that was "Just Do It," and sort of revolutionized Nike. Think about your own ad campaign. And, and ultimately, what are you selling yourself on? So if 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 in my mind, I'm, you know what, I, I can never get fit. I've never really had the endurance to finish a marathon. I've never really uh, 
been good managing my money. I've never really been great in a relationship. I've never been a finisher. I've never been a fourth quarter athlete. I've never been a good game player. I've always been a great practice player. I've been a great game player, but not a good practice player. Think about these ad campaigns that we've convinced ourselves that they're real. Right. And, and, and so therefore, if my own belief is 10 times more powerful than the outside belief, then where's the real strength in my life? I can't blame other people. Fundamentally, I have to blame myself. And, and that's where um, that's where ultimately that's why you see so many people overcome uh, incredibly challenging environments uh, and, and, and find a way to succeed. But if your internal environment is the one where the real challenge is, then you're going to have a very difficult time overcoming that. And so d- just to break it down in its simplest form, how do you help athletes overcome some of those negative beliefs about themselves? How do you, how do you help them sh- uh, turn it into a positive ad camp or a, 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 an ad campaign that works for them? Well, I, I think half the battle is awareness. Mm-hmm. So, so, you know, I think one of the ways that we've taught for years has always been um, with as many anecdotal stories and visual examples and pieces from, you know, uh, uh, ESPN 30 for 30 or, or, you know, just all sorts of or, you know, going back to the 90s, the sports century. One of the things that you find is success leaves clues. So typically people who are succeeding across multiple platforms are doing similar things. So the the first thing, though, is you have to help people understand how to get out of their own way. So the real challenge in our life is how negativity is playing a role. So to the degree that I understand when I say something out loud, so one of the things I'll do is I show a number of examples of negative thinking. So it could be Roger Federer two years ago in the U.S. Open early on saying, I'm not in a safe place mentally. And no matter who I play, I need them to play poorly because I'm not in a position to beat anybody. Now, this is one of the ultimate great thinkers and you hear someone like him articulating that early, you know he's going to lose. Right. Or you watch Tiger in his early career explain losses versus Tiger in the latter part of his career explain the same scores and the same losses completely differently. One is in a neutral way. You know what? I wasn't where I wanted to be off the tee today, but I feel really good in the fairways and to the green. You know, I just need to find a way to, to finish a little bit better in this area, but I like where I'm going as opposed to, I don't know what's wrong with me. And, 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 and I just, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not in a good place. And, and, uh, or crazy examples from like the 1986 World Series where, Billy Buckner, the famous baseball player that lets the ball go through his legs for the Boston Red Sox, did an interview before that play and said, you know, my worst fear is to let the ball go through my legs to cost my team the World Series. And out of here. It what's true. Wow. And we have to we have to understand the relationship between our language and what happens next to us. Mm -hmm. And and so I, I don't think like Michael, if, 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 if we're facing doubt inside our own mind, I, I'm not going to, to uh, undersell the, the fact that there is, there is something powerful to mindfulness, to affirmations, to eidetic imagery, uh, to visualization. Uh, and, and that's where we can ultimately change our internal ad campaign uh, and, and, and learn to see ourselves differently and then ultimately to become that. But when I'm articulating things that are hurting myself constantly, like, I hate this weather, or oh, I didn't realize I'm competing against him today, or I start talking about these things, then it instantly is 10 times more powerful than when it's just living in my mind, going back to your Navy SEAL comment. So if people just understand, shut your mouth. Like that in itself is the first win. And that is the real strength. It's not hard. 
I am always in control of what I say out loud. I am always in control of the music I listen to. I'm always in control of the things I watch to some degree. Um, and I just think, like, I think of this year, uh, I was just out the last couple of days with Kirby Smart um, and, and, you know, coaches right now are, are, are traveling around. They're speaking to uh, different constituencies within their their football communities. And I was I was just remembering the the Rose Bowl this year. And uh, and it was the tale of two halves. And for people who follow college football, you know, Oklahoma had uh, a lot of hype and this great quarterback, Baker Mayfield. They were a great offense. University of Georgia was a great defense. And we're down, I think, 17 points at halftime. And just, you know, for me as a, as a mental conditioning consultant, it was um, my third Rose Bowl. Uh, and then ultimately, this was my seventh national championship just on the sideline. And you observe and you watch. And, and I have a role I've got to play. But you also experience what's happening, good and bad. And to see our language and to see... Uh, our running back, Sony Michelle, come over and say, this is what we're going to do. This is how we're going to finish. Um, it doesn't matter what happened the first 30 minutes. This is who we're going to be the next 30 minutes. And and this ability to stay in the present and, and to be neutral and to hear our players talking about being neutral. Right. And, and, and having the awareness to understand that that was something. And even though if I Google right now positive thinking, I'm going to see 37 million things. If I Google neutral thinking, I'm going to see four total. Right. And they're going to be children's books. So um, I just think if we can expand awareness and and help people understand that there are experts out there that are not telling you to pretend that bad didn't happen. Mm -hmm. But we are asking you to not give bad power over what happens next and – the uncertainty is scary in life, um, but it also is where the real growth and the real excitement is. Finish these sentences for me. If you really knew me, you know that I. That everything that I teach, uh, I have to constantly challenge myself to apply within my own life. Failure is. An invitation to find a better way forward. Success is? Feeling okay with the way you executed whatever it was you were shooting for today. Excellent. Can you talk about viewing an event as a challenge versus a threat? I've heard, I've heard you speak about this, and I think it's super interesting. Well, I I think probably the greatest experience for me going back to my time at, 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 at IMG and then, then at Exos, um, and then just, just really being around Alabama and Florida state and all these different places being around is just, you learn like, like you get to see success in action. And one of the things that I think is unique to the athletic world and, and I believe it has relevance, obviously, within the, the, the military community and the business community. But the scoreboard is so real. You know, like in a CrossFit competition, the outcome is, you know, uh, not just in your workout of the day, but, but in, in your, you know, you start at A and the outcome is going to be B and you're going to see it. You're, you either did it or you didn't. And in, in sports, it's clear you, you either win or you don't. Um, and so – in the process, you just get to meet so many different people. And probably in the late 2000s and early 2010, 2011, uh, I think with just the, the some of the movies, Lone Survivor and all those things, there was a, a huge uh, collaboration that started happening between the special operations community and um, and the uh, the sports world. And so I, I got to meet super cool people like Dave Castro and Captain Tom Chaby and Floyd McClendon and, you know, Admiral Krongard and, you know, Admiral Joe McGuire and just all sorts of really neat people. And the military community was basically saying, how do we take better physiological care of our operators? Because the, we're just beating them up and, 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 and bragging about it. 
where the athletic world is is taking care of their population so they can sustain their excellence for a long period of time. And then we really wanted to know, like, how, how do you develop such incredible resilience and, and this uh, comfort with the unknown that athletes struggle with? Um, so we kind of began this unique synergy. And one of the things that I learned uh, within that was this concept that the, the SEAL community, at least on the, the West Coast teams, had been you know using like looking at adversity as a challenge as opposed to a threat. And they just explained it in very simple terms. When we feel threatened uh, in any part of our life, uh, from a, a burglar to uh, a health challenge to you know failing a class, physiologically we just shut down. Like oh my god, like it's fight or flight. Like mm-hmm. I am this. I'm gonna get my ass smoked right now. But if we if, if we look at it as a challenge, okay. Like I just walked into this bar. Uh, she's not looking at me. Like this is not a threat to my manhood. Like I'm being challenged right now to find a way to. Uh, get this young lady to look at me. That's a simple level. Uh, but it, you know, athletically like, okay, I'm three minutes off the pace. I want to be, uh, doesn't mean I can't do it. This is a challenge. How am I going to go from three minutes to two minutes and 45 seconds? Uh, it, it's just a, it's just a different way in which you look at it. And, and, uh, a challenge physiologically brings out the best in us. A threat physiologically shuts us down. It's just in the same way, um, how do we see something good in our life and believe that we expect it to continue when something bad happens and we expect it to be short term? I have a lot of people that I that I meet and, and spend time with that see good things as short term and bad things as uh, pervasive. Mm-hmm. Um, what I guess I've figured out, Michael, is, is people say, well, well, you know, who's the population you spend time with most often? I really try to spend my most time and think I can help people who are really, really high performers. And I don't spend a lot of time outside of that world. And so uh, I think the best businesses, the best athletes, the best competitors, the best, uh, uh, you know, groups within the military, um, the, the techs, the cybersecurity world. I, I think if you're doing a lot of things well within your business or in your life, but you recognize that your mind is something that you're battling a little bit. If you can get this area right, I think it can get you a, a three to 5% advantage. I think anybody that comes in and says your mind is 70% of the battle, it's not, it just isn't. Um, it's a, uh, it's a steering wheel. And if you have a car like, uh, that doesn't have a good engine that has flat tires that, uh, isn't painted well, um, doesn't have good seats, uh, but it has a really good steering wheel, then like, what does it matter if you're going the right direction, if you can't go with any force? Right. Um, but what happens if you have an incredible car with 28 inch rims, with spinners, with, with a great engine, with a, you know, V12 and all these elements, but you can't steer it, you know? So like fundamentally, uh, you gotta be fit. You gotta eat well, you gotta sleep. Uh, if you're an athlete, you got a foam roll. You you got to do simple better. You got to do all those things well. And then I think the mind um, can can be a force multiplier for you. But um, to think that I can just think well and overcome not taking care of myself uh, or not having uh, you know the operational tools to succeed or in business not making 15 calls a week to new clients. I mean. You know, successful people do what unsuccessful people don't like to do. There's no magic. I mean, mm-hmm. I will buy every book in an airport just like you probably do, Michael. Like, I'm, I'm all about the five-step formula to right. a better uh, marriage or a better relationship or, um, you know, and, and, and these are areas that I've, that, that, you know, I, I've suffered in, like in, uh, you know, traveling so much, it, uh, it took a, a brutal toll on my marriage, but it wasn't the complicated elements. It was like, all right, I'm on the road and I'm trying to have a conversation with my significant other and I'm watching TV, I'm on Twitter and I'm typing up my notes for Georgia the next day. Mm-hmm. You, mm-hmm. you can't, you can't communicate with somebody doing that. Right. right. So like, how do you do simple better in that part of your life? You turn your TV off. You turn your phone upside down so you're not on Twitter. You shut your computer. You shut the the, the the lights off, and you engage. And it's that's it. 
Like people that are looking for complicated answers uh, when fundamentally success is about simplicity, then you're, you're, you're always keeping success at a distance from you where it's not, it's not a distant thing. It's a, it's a, it's a thing that's three inches from you. And it starts with just taking a step towards doing what other people around you who are succeeding are doing. Right. Um, and that's, and it, does aptitude matter? Yeah, of course, aptitude matters, but it doesn't matter as much as we think. I, I, like, you know, Dave Castro being my friend, me knowing some of the population uh, within CrossFit, uh, I, I don't always see, uh, you know, uh, Usain Bolt's out there. Mm-hmm. Um, and even let's take Usain Bolt, for example. I encourage people to, to watch his movie, I Am Bolt. Um, you're not supposed to be a great sprinter at 6'5". You know, like, so this guy's the best sprinter in the world, and he's 6'5", and he has scoliosis and lordosis. And so, but we want to attribute his success to, oh, well, God gave him these things that uh, God didn't give me. That's, that's not why Alabama's good. Alabama is willing to do what your ass won't do. And, and that's, that's the truth. And, and that's where we got to look ourselves in the mirror and say, all right, my marriage went south because I didn't do this, this, and this, and that's on me. And either I'm going to do those things and fix what I have now, or going forward in my next relationship, I'm going to do that better. But I'm not going to attribute these factors that, well, God was unfair to me. Um, and I'm not saying that we don't have different gifts of aptitude. We do. Uh, but I don't think uh, aptitude is the defining characteristic. I, I would take attitude over aptitude any day. Oh, shit. Oh. This fires me up, man. I love it. Uh, in, in reference to Michael Johnson, I've heard you say it wasn't what he did that made him successful as much as the, thi- as much as the things he was willing not to do. What do you mean by that? Well, I, I feel really blessed that in, in 2000, in 2001, my partner, who who you don't probably hear as much about, uh, a guy named Chad Bowling. He's the uh, director of mental conditioning for the Yankees and the Dallas Cowboys. Uh, to me, I think he's, you know, I don't know a lot of people in this industry, so there's probably a lot better than both of us. Um, but to me, he's the one that I look up to the most within the t- mental conditioning sports psychology business. Um you know, Tom Condon, the great football agent, you know, for Eli and Peyton Manning and all those. And, you know, uh, he, he called us and said, hey, I want to send Mike down, you know, to 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 help with these guys getting ready for the draft. And it was Breeze and LaDainian Tomlinson and a bunch of different guys at the time. And and we ran that program. I mean, I'm 24. Chad's 25. We probably didn't deserve to be running that program, but we were and picking guys up at the airport, training them for the combine, training them for the psychometric tests. And so Michael came in and, and he sat down for like 90 minutes before he was going to work with guys on the start. And he was just coming off the Sydney Olympics. Um, and he just talked about like what allowed him to be number one in the world for 11 years. And I remember just thinking like, all right, if this guy ran Google, if this guy ran, uh, you know, Lego, if this guy's as an athlete, whatever this guy's going to do, he's going to succeed because he not only knows what it takes, but he knows what he needs to do to, to be able to succeed at a really high level. And I hadn't met, I guess to that point, I'd never met anybody quite like that. Um, and then Michael was transitioning to this next phase in his life and he sat down with Chad and I and he said, you know, as much as I love the gold medals I've been able to, to, to win through the first 31 years of my life, I'd also like to think I can win gold medals in the next phase of my life. And, um, and so we just built a relationship and he became one of my closer friends and, and he also became a real good check and balance. So if I had Freddie Adu or Alabama or any of these things, I, uh, I would call Mike and say, Hey, I'm thinking about doing this. What do you think? And I knew I had a world-class athlete that could say, Hey, that's stupid. Or I don't know. Why don't you try it? Or, um, yeah, that's a really good thing. Why don't you do that? And I could bring him in as a reference. And over the years, all these athletes I've, you know, Hey, Michael, will you talk to Freddie? Hey, uh, Eli, will you talk to Ben Watson or will you talk to the U.S. soccer team? And then just because 
everybody who's succeeding is doing the same things and we can all learn from each other. And I think a rising tide lifts all boats. And I hope ultimately the strength and conditioning industry becomes more of that way uh, and less protective and more uh, collaborative. And, and I feel like I'm very collaborative because I don't think there's anything that I know that other people don't know. Um, so I think we're, we're, what I learned from Michael was that, yeah, he had this great platform, but it was so simple and he had this discipline. And one of the questions they asked him was like, okay, you're world athlete of the year. Like, you know, what's your social life like? And, and he talked about all these opportunities that opened up to him socially where he could date like Adam Clayton, you know, U2's bass player's girlfriend. And, but he had to choose not to do that because he couldn't be number one in the world and do that and that he could be number five in the world, but for, he knew what it took and he had to be willing to, he couldn't go to the Academy Awards. He couldn't go to the Oscars. He couldn't do those things. Not until his career ended uh, and have the the competitive focus he needed. And he ultimately called it the paradox of success. And that's, that's a bummer for athletes unless you take judgment out of it. Like, and just say, you know Uh what? I'm not going to judge the fact that I can't do this. I'm going to accept what it takes to succeed and keep doing that. Right. And that's where we get derailed. That's why sustaining success is its own challenge because, you know, I I was just with one of the top businesses in, in, in the United States and they had this underdog mentality for years and I just reoriented them and I just said, stop, you are not an underdog. You know, when you hit 10 figures, you're not an underdog. Mm -hmm. You are a favorite. And, and when you, but I'm talking to them about what it means to be a favorite. They think a favorite is complacent. They think a favorite doesn't work hard. And I said, I don't know what kind of favorite you're talking about, but I've never met a favorite like that. A favorite knows they're good and wears it well. They want the, the burden of expectations. I would rather be a favorite than an underdog. Mm -hmm. I'd rather go into a race expected to win than to surprise people. And you can't keep surprising people and be good. At some point, you're going to have to be good and know you're good and know that other people know you're good and know why you're good and be able to do the shit that good people do and be okay with the fact that there's expectations on you, but ultimately own those expectations and make them yours. That's what made Michael Johnson so unique. Instead of being intimidated by the outside expectations of Nike or the United States, he said, I am going to put on gold shoes and make this pressure mine. I am not going to let myself get a bronze medal wearing gold shoes. And that to me, I'd never, ever seen anybody wow. like that in my life. That's, that's, that seems like taking the, the language thing to another level. Right. And, 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 but I've also watched him like take the next phase of his life with incredible humility as he's learning to run businesses and build Michael Johnson performance. And, um, I mean, the guy's just a winner, you know, and, that so you get a chance to be around a lot of winners then you also get to to be around some people that have been successful didn't really know why and and they're okay just you know what i'm gonna i'm just gonna be famous for a little while then i'm gonna fade and you have to respect people's rights to fail you know like a lot of people um you know they're they're not willing to do what it takes to succeed and that's okay Mm -hmm. and and people you have to look think about a bell curve like if 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 I was at Harvard Business School with with Russell recently, and it was a really cool thing just to get to, to guest lecture out there. But I told him, like, you know, when you look at an a, an A, you know, only ten percent of people in in any walk of life are getting an A, or in any class are getting an A. So that means you know, eighty percent and below are going to be you know at average or below average. So like. That's just the way life is. There's a lot of average ass people out there and you got to let them be average. Now, I I don't want to be average and I don't want to be around average people, you know, but you have to respect people's rights. You know what? Uh, They're not going to eat well. Mm -hmm. They're not going to train. They're not going to work hard. They're going to just be okay in business. They're not going to take their marriage to the next level. They're not going to be a great parent. They're not going to like that's okay. Like people can be that way. And then you've got other people that are constantly going to be challenging themselves like that they're going to be really uncomfortable being average. You know, like I have, you know, I have some new challenges in my life where I'm like where 
I suck at them right now. Like I'm like, I can't believe how bad I suck at this, but I don't like average. So I'm really like trying to, as I meet new people and I I almost want to send people like an evaluation, like, why did I suck in this situation? And like evaluate me because I hate sucking. You know, as funny as that is, or, or even as I, I, I left these big businesses and went out on my own and like, why do I not know what I'm doing? But I, I, I didn't know what I'm doing. So I, you have to learn. But the, the best thing that I've liked about it is I don't like not being good at something. And, and I'm okay with that. Um, and so uh, I'm trying to surround myself around people like you, Michael, that they don't like that either. Right. You know, and, and this is one of the points I'll make. Um, all the answers are out there. Like all the answers are out there. It's just we got to be at a place where we're ready to, to, to hear those answers. And, and sometimes we're just at points in our life where we're just not ready. And, uh, and that's okay. Like, and, and it might be three years from now. It might be three days from now. Um, I've learned to not judge people. Um, and, uh, you know, that I'm not more right than other people. Um, you know, people always ask me about this industry. Well, hey, what do you think of this guy or this guy? Like, hey, I don't know them, but they're great. Or I'm, are, if they're helping people, they're influencing. That's great. I don't compare myself to other people in this industry, and and uh, you know, I just uh, I feel like uh, now I'm at a place where we got a mission, and and I want to take. Uh, I don't want people to be so intimidated by thinking. I want people to do the easy things. Like, hey, man, don't watch news for eight hours. Hey, don't verbalize those things. Be really careful of the music you're listening to. Just remove the negativity and watch how you literally rise like a balloon. Mm -hmm. It'll be crazy if you just did that right, how much better you would be. I mean, imagine competing in CrossFit with a 100-pound vest. Like, just take the vest off. You know, I'm not asking you to, to get more muscles. And, like, uh, think about it nutritionally like this. Okay? Uh, I eat a whole bag of Doritos right now. That's negativity. And, but I'm like, oh, man, I got to be positive. So I eat three apples. Okay? Well, it's great I ate three apples. But it would have been better if I just didn't eat the Doritos. And right, and, right. and I think the sooner we think That's that. Great analogy. Um, like, you know. Uh, to me, or sometimes I just say, you know what, Michael, I'm going to eat the Doritos today and I'm going to accept the consequences or, and and that's okay too. You know, so, uh, Russell Wilson did a great thing. It's a super cool. And I'm not objective when it comes to my, the athletes I get to work with. And so it is what it is, but he created this app called trace me, uh, T R A C E space me. And, and he did it with, uh, you know, some of his, uh, you know, friends kind of in the business and the Hollywood community. But um, on there, on that app, we did this little piece called Dangerous Minds. And, and his tag name is Dangerous Wilson. And, uh, um, and we put like 24 units out where just two, three minute things where we literally just tried to walk through the things that we've worked on with him for the last six years. And this guy's a like this guy is an incredible thinker who has no problems, and yet every week during the season for the last six years, you know we've met together on Thursdays, and yet he has no problems, and and so he operates off the premise that you don't need to be sick to get better. But if your population is like, <clears throat> all right, this guy's interesting, I'd like to learn more. And if by the way, if your population isn't, that's okay too, you know. Um, but if they are, like you could actually go there onto this trace me. It's for free. And this dangerous minds, we actually try to explain the progression. The first eight to ten episodes are, are Russell and I together. If you're not a, a, a sport fan, uh, Russell is just a unique uh, person. Um, he's a five foot ten inch athlete who doesn't fit any of the model of like why he succeeds. He, he, you shouldn't look the way he does and succeed. And yet he's doing it, uh, which is incredible. And he attributes a lot of that to his habits. Uh, he, he, he has 
full-time strength coach, a full-time physical therapist, a full-time nutritionist, a full-time massage therapist, and a full-time yoga expert in addition to a mental conditioning expert, in addition to everything the Seattle Seahawks has. He's not doing that because he he wants to make a statement to the world. He's doing that so he can win. And through six years, he's won more games than anybody in the history of football. Wow. Obviously, a big, big part of that's his team, but he is not waiting for things to go wrong he is progressively trying to meet the challenges in advance of being challenged so i I, we're wrapping it up here uh one of the things that you started to talk about earlier was this piece about uncertainty i know that you're really excited about uh venturing off on your own right now so my question is what would you say to someone that has a terrible relationship with uncertainty and just feels paralyzed with fear? Maybe they're afraid to really set their sights on a big goal to change jobs, to ask someone out. How can they change it from, uh, you know, a pattern of inaction to embracing uncertainty? Yeah. uh, I mean, that's, um, it's a discipline. So, you know, we talk about what you're willing to do, what you're not willing to do. Uh, first, you got to start listening to your language. So when I'm on the phone, am I saying, I don't think I'm going to be able to make this business work? So what if you say, well, tr- well Trevor, that's how I feel. You've, you've got to learn to, if you're going to verbalize it, you've got to learn to verbalize it in a way that gives you room to make it work. Right. So, hey, um, man, so a lot I'm, I'm figuring out how not to do right now with respect to this business. Um, I, I've got to keep finding better ways to find more clients to, to engage so there's not so much month at the end of my check or, or, or whatever. Or in relationships, uh, if you're trying to meet new people, um, you, have, you have to go out and meet new people. And and you have to go back to the early areas of your life. Like think about, think about if you were two, three, four years old, and your parents said, "You know what? Um, I know you don't like getting up and falling. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a couple of years off, and we're just going to keep you on this chair. And then when you're six, we're going to let you get up and start running. Like that's not how it works, right? So, but our, you know, our uh, Converse had this. Uh, statement champions are, are born not made um, I, I think uh, I think champions are born and then we're unmade and like I think we got to get back to that mindset where we're not afraid to fall down like um, you know I'm, I'm in a phase where I'm meeting new people at, at, at different times in different areas and just like like just laughing at myself like God, like how could I be so good in some areas and just like not good in that area? But you have to go out and experience it. So for people trying to meet new people, you have to keep pushing yourself into environments to meet new people, and and then and 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 through uh, a, a a bigger pool of people, you're going to have a better chance to find someone that you're going to connect with. From a business perspective, um, understand that nobody succeeds without uncertainty. And don't start looking for, well, this person has a trust fund, this person. You can always find people who had an easy road, but the world is full of a lot more people who've made it with a challenging road. Um, So I just think to really – Russell Wilson three years ago at the one-yard line in the Super Bowl threw an interception that many people thought he would never be able to recover from. And – I remember when we were down in Rancho Santa Fe uh, and we were, all we tried to do was just have a great off season because that's all you could do. Uh, we were training three times a day with a great speed coach, Ryan Flaherty. And, that's funny. But I, I would interviewed go, Ryan two days ago. Did you? Yeah. yeah. So and, and, and I had like I wasn't at Exos anymore. And I just said, hey, Russ, let's go. Let's go talk to Todd Durkin. Let's go talk to Exos. Let's go talk to all these different people. And let's just figure out who's best. And Jameis Winston was down training. And Jameis, uh, uh, Jameis was uh, Trev. You got to check out uh, Ryan. So we went and we met with Ryan, and and Ryan was the perfect guy for Russell at that time. And uh, so uh, 
but I remember, so, so my significant other and I were like staying down there and, and we're kind of hubbing out of, uh, uh, Carl's, uh, Carlsbad. And every morning I would go to pick, uh, Russ up. Um, he would have this music playing and it was like really uplifting but in my mind, I was like, ah, it's Christian music, like it's Joy FM, and and but I started to notice that it it would affect me, and I would have more energy in all the things that we would do throughout the day. And I was typically like a news radio or sports radio person. And long story short, I eventually was like, what is this? And he said, well, it's Hillsong United. And you know, I was like a traditional. I had my relationship with religion, but I wouldn't say I was strong one way or the other. But I didn't judge the religious part of it, and I m- more looked at the the way it made me feel. And so I started listening to this in the morning and realized that I could run faster. I felt better during the day. I, you know, and and then I really started to evaluate like where negativity was coming in my life. And 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 that year for Lent, I gave up the news, and. Uh, and just started feeling so much lighter. Um, and I think that like tried to, and, and when I studied it, I realized that this Christian music and a lot of just pop music in general has these major chord progressions that crescendo at this unique time that are made to make you feel a certain way in, in the way a great commercial would work. And then I started thinking like, okay, why would I not want to feel that way? Like, of course I want to feel that way. So I'm going to listen to this music. And it's just one little thing like that. You start to see like that's part of the reason that this guy is who he is. And he's not turning on the news and engaging like, you know, like this president's tweets or like this controversy in the world. Or, and it's not that you can pretend that that doesn't exist. And we need to know that that exists. And we need to, to contribute to society. And we need to, to, to Republican, Democrat, uh, independent that's we you know we need to know what's going on in the world but but how much do we really need to know and 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 so like i think that that's something that i'd forgotten and that's an adjustment that you can make so for people out there who are facing uncertainty right now in their lives um understand that way more people than you think are facing the same uncertainty manage your body language Manage what you listen to. Manage what you say out loud. I am not telling you to just pretend it's not happening, but don't give it any more power than it needs to have. And, you know, fundamentally, think about it in these terms. You know, Michael Johnson once told me that uh, he based his the plan that he would develop in his own life off grocery shopping. That when he went into a grocery shop, he f- uh, he found that if he wrote things down, he would succeed more efficiently, quicker, and he would come back with the things he needed. And we look at my communities like goal setting, smart goals, specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, and within a time frame. Like, shut up with that. Like, <laughs> you know, like more. goal set because you do it in a grocery store. And that's if you look at things from that uh, primal of a way, then you're not judging like, well, I I don't want to set smart goals. You're doing it because you would do it grocery shopping. Why wouldn't you do it in your life? So write it down, review it. Um, It goes to the frontal cortex of your brain. So you're thinking about it and you're looking at the things that I want to be. I mean, I look at my own phone right now and and I think of this things that uh, I have two things written down, uh, on my phone. And, uh, if I look at my screenshot, it says do right by all people and live in alignment with my values. And, and, and those are really important to me. Like, am I being kind to people? Like, that's a big thing for me right now. Um, that, you know, that kindness is a skill like, and, and is kindness a normal part of my life? Like, am I kind to people? Um, and I realized, you know, that there's areas I got to be better and be more kind. And and uh, and then am I living in accordance with my values? And, uh, you know, having this conversation today for 
uh, an hour and a half is, is, is within my values. It's a, I'm talking to somebody who looks at life the way I do and B we're, we're neither you or myself is pretending to have any solutions, but to the degree we might've learned something that could help people, we're trying to pay it forward. So I feel like, and, and then B, I hiked two hours, even though I bit it twice uh, and ran my head into a rock. Um, I, it, the fitness component makes me feel better about myself. Um, so I, you know, I've done that. And, and then, um, you know, I've done some things that help my family. Uh, I'm making some big sacrifices in my life right now to help my family, uh, which uh, make me feel better about what I'm doing in my own life. And then... Um, you know, and then I also have some pretty significant challenges too, and things I'm concerned about. But I'm 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 not giving those more credit than they need to. Um, you know, and uh, you know I'm I'm ultimately uh, trying to continue to learn, um, and 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 be present. So uh, I think that that's the best advice I could be. Yes, uncertainty is scary, but when we when we're in a place of total certainty, there's a chance we're not growing anymore. Right. Well, man, it, it, it's inspiring to see you walking the walk. You know, it, it's like you're one of the most successful people in your industry. And you're you're telling us that you still experience the same types of feelings and challenges as everyone else. So this was phenomenal, man. Uh, thank you so much for your time. One of my biggest takeaways from today is do simple better. I, I really, really love that approach as well as the the neutrality. The, those are some huge aha moments for me. And like I said, I've, I've been obsessed with this stuff for a long time and your perspective is very unique. And I think people are going to get a ton out of this show. Where can people keep up with you, uh, find out more about what you do? Yeah, you know, I'm I'm learning more about the the social media element. Um, so we have um, M O A W A D underscore uh, G R O U P, the Moad Group. Um, I, I think going forward, there's some new business things that we're working on that are going to be super cool uh, that will be coming down the road. But I think Moad Group, we, we, we try to put out some uh, unique information. Uh, I think as it relates to some of the things we talk about, uh, the NFL does an incredible job on YouTube uh, with a, a process called Sound FX. Uh, you can see Russell Wilson 2014 AFC Championship. You could also watch Tom Brady uh, Super Bowl 51. Uh, where you see him down 28-3 applying the same things that uh, Michael and I were just talking about. Um, you know, I've done a, a couple other podcasts. Uh, John Brinkus, who, who did uh, ESPN Sports Science, uh, we did a podcast um, where he, like you, Michael, asked uh, – I, I think any podcast is about as good as the questions that you ask. Um, and so um, I think that uh, you can find some. Um, my father wrote a book called The Secret of the Slight Edge. Uh, by uh, Bob Moad, I, I think uh, um, he he passed away ten years ago, but I think there are a lot of things on that that you can uh, that you can gain. It's it's a it's a big font, um, and then I would also um, y you know lastly say if you get a chance to check out uh, ESPN show QB to QB. Uh, it was uh, five episodes this year. We replaced the John Gruden show, but it, it's it's one of the first shows that uh, include the mental conditioning component um, with with athletes. Uh, and uh, I think you can get it on the ESPN Plus app. That and, and Draft Academy, which I also did with uh, with Jordan Palmer, um, also hits a lot proactively on this mindset piece. So. Michael, thanks for giving us the platform, and um, and uh, to the degree you want to uh, hit us up, I do know how to work Twitter. It's been three nice. months now, so I'm, I'm learning how to do it, uh, but we have some other people that are running our Instagram and some other things, and anybody that wants to reach out. Uh, I'm a big fan of uh, – I, I first got embedded. I know you're not just the CrossFit community. You're a lot of communities, but uh, I really love – kind of what uh, the fitness community broadly uh, is doing proactively. And I, I, I love the CrossFit community. And, and it reminded me when we started talking today that I need to reach back out to Dave Castro and some of those guys and just, just relink up um, because um, the competitive nature and this, this quest to, to be really good but still improve is what your community out there is looking for. Uh, and that's right up uh, my alley. So I'm, I'm hoping that uh, – that we can uh, 
that we can that we can stay aligned, Michael, and that there's more I can do to help. Uh, I think that's really uh, the challenge that I need to do. This needs this information needs to be less about this one percent of one percent of one percent. You know, that's in this unique football coach archetype.